Hi there. Today we're going to talk about fluoxetine. Fluoxetine is used by doctors to treat patients who suffer from major depressive disorders. This could be major depression, bulimia nervosa, which is binge eating and vomiting, and also obsessive compulsive disorder, commonly known as OCD. While these diseases can affect anyone and come in many different strengths, today we will focus on fluoxetine and its use in treating major depression. Before we proceed, it is essential to understand what major depression is. Once we have an understanding, we can see how fluoxetine is used to treat it. So what causes depression? The first major hypothesis of depression was formulated about 30 years ago and proposed that the main symptoms of depression are a result of a functional deficiency of the brain's monoaminergic transmitters norepinephrine, serotonin, also known as 5-HT, and dopamine. Everything we do relies on neurons communicating with one another. When the action potential reaches the end of an axon, most neurons release a chemical message, a neurotransmitter, which crosses the synapse and binds to receptors on the receiving neuron's dendrites. This helps in successfully transferring the message between two neurons. During depression, however, neurotransmitters such as serotonin are reabsorbed quickly by the sending neuron. Consequently, less serotonin remains in the synaptic cleft for the receiving neuron to bind onto, which ultimately leads to abnormal moods. This illustrates that behavioral consequences of depression may arise from altered synthesis, storage, or release of the neurotransmitters as well as from disturbed sensitivity of their receptors. Now that we understand the cause of depression, we can begin to understand the history of fluoxetine and how it works. While paving the way for antidepressant drugs, fluoxetine's discovery also provided a solution to a common psychiatric disorder that many people have experienced. In the early 1970s, evidence of the role of serotonin also known as 5-hydroxytryptamine, or 5-HT for short, in depression began to emerge and the hypothesis that enhancing serotonin neurotransmission would be a viable mechanism to mediate antidepressant response was introduced. Given this, efforts commenced in order to develop agents that inhibit the uptake of serotonin from the synaptic cleft. In late 1971, Brian Molly and Eli Lilly synthesized a range of new compounds, a group of phenyl-oxyphenyl propyl amines from diphenhydramine, an antihistamine found to inhibit reuptake of the neurotransmitter serotonin. One of these compounds, Lilly 110140, later in 1975 called fluoxetine, was found to be highly selective, affecting only the neurotransmitter serotonin. This was a huge breakthrough as the selectivity of fluoxetine is what makes it such an effective drug. Using Lilly 110140 and other tricyclic antidepressive agents, norepinephrine, dopamine, and the inhibition of serotonin were measured and compared in a series of experiments on rat brains using the inhibition constant Ki. Lilly 110140, a secondary amine, was found to have a greater affinity for the uptake sites of serotonin than for the sites of norepinephrine and dopamine uptake. In 1973, the CNS Research Committee at Eli Lilly decided to form a project team on fluoxetine to guide it to product development. This team would be named Psychotropic Agent LY110140. During safety studies in rats and dogs, the team learned that fluoxetine showed the presence of phospholipidosis. This led to pausing the project for nine months because they learned that cationic amphilic molecules could cause a reversible accumulation of phospholipid in tissues. After confirming that several other marketed drugs were known to cause phospholipidosis in humans with no problematic side effects, the team continued their work. In 1976, Lemberger, who was a clinical investigator at the Lilly Laboratory of Clinical Research, first administered fluoxetine to humans. He found that doses of fluoxetine as high as 90 mg were well tolerated by volunteers. It was truly a rewarding experience to find that for the first time in humans, fluoxetine selectively and effectively inhibited 5-HT uptake by blood platelets and had no demonstrable adrenergic effects on the cardiovascular system, even though both processes were in peripheral systems. The clinical results of all the trials were compiled in more than a hundred volumes of two-inch binders for the submission of an NDA, which is a new drug application, to the US FDA in 1983. The journey of fluoxetine took more than 16 years and required thousands of work, dedication inside and outside Eli Lilly, as well as the participation of thousands of patients to make it to the market. In January 1988, fluoxetine was launched under the trade name Prozac. 
Fun fact, the name Prozac was created by a marketing team where Pro stands for professional and AC for activity, while the Z brings the two together. Now that we have laid the historical foundation of fluoxetine, we can begin to discuss how it works. Fluoxetine preferentially acts to inhibit the reuptake transporter for serotonin. Fluoxetine has a high and selective affinity for these serotonin transporters and therefore blocks serotonin from binding to the transporters and being absorbed into the presynaptic cells. As a result of the excess serotonin in the synaptic cleft, which we mentioned earlier to be the region of space between two neurons where nerve impulses are transmitted by a neurotransmitter, there is an overactivation of the postsynaptic receptors. In other words, a lot of serotonin is received by the postsynaptic receptors, and these signals help improve the mood of the individual. Long-term administration of fluoxetine causes a reduction in the production of the reuptake transporters and their binding sites. These responses at the receptors and to transporters are thought to produce the antidepressant effects of fluoxetine. Now you might be wondering how fluoxetine does this. To better understand that, let's take a look at its structure-activity relationship. Compounds containing an aryloxypropylamine motif in their structure, demonstrated in figure A, are known as monoamine reuptake inhibitors. Drugs containing this privileged structural motif, where R1 and R2 are aryls or heteroaryls, preferably phenol, possess a selectivity profile for norepinephrine transporters and serotonin transporters. While compounds containing a substituent in the 2' position of the aeroxyl ring of the structure, as you can see in figure B, this selectivity and high affinity for norepinephrine transporters generally works on norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, whereas compounds such as fluoxetine has a substituent in the 4' position which has selectivity and high affinity for serotonin transporters and is therefore generally considered a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And yep, you guessed it, that's why it's categorized as an SSRI. As we can see, fluoxetine is based on this and as such has a substituent on the fourth carbon of the ring. We're now going to take a look at the synthesis of fluoxetine. Clinical fluoxetine is a racemic mixture of the R and S enantiomers and they are of equivalent pharmacologic activity. Hence, the fluoxetine synthesis we consider here refers to the formation of racemic fluoxetine. The synthesis employed a manic reaction with acetophenone to provide a beta dimethyl aminopropiophenone. It was then dissolved in a THF solution of 4 equivalent diborane. An acetic workup then provides a racemic secondary alcohol. The alcohol was dissolved in chloroform and saturated with anhydrous hydrochloric gas, while sulfuryl chloride was added. After evaporation of the solvent, the mixture was collected as a crystalline hydrochloride salt. The salt was added to an alkaline solution of 4-trifluorophenol to afford a phenoxy ether. The ether is then converted to an n sino derivative in the presence of CNBr benzene and toluene. Basic hydrolysis of the n sino derivative gives racemic fluoxetine as a free base. Like most medicines, when fluoxetine is administered, it can have both on-target and off-target side effects. One of the main on-target side effects results from excessively increasing doses of fluoxetine. This causes nerve cell overactivity due to the accumulation of serotonin in the brain, leading to a collection of symptoms known as serotonin syndrome. This can also occur within hours when the patient starts the medication. The most common serotonin syndrome symptoms are headache, vomiting, diarrhea, tremors, and a rapid heart rate. For the off-target side effects of fluoxetine, a promising study indicates that fluoxetine can reduce the risk of colon cancer. It was found to inhibit the development of carcinogen-induced preneoplastic lesions in colon tissues, but the mechanisms of action are not well understood. Fluoxetine was able to reduce the development of MNNG-induced dysplasia and vascularized-related dysplasia in colon tissue. Taken together, these findings explain partially why there is a low colon cancer risk with patients under antidepressant therapy. Moving on, the half-life of fluoxetine is long-lasting, approximately 2-3 to three days. It is metabolized and likely to remain in the body for several weeks after discontinuation. This is important information to be considered when counseling a patient. Fluoxetine should not be used during pregnancy unless the benefits outweigh the risks, and should also be avoided during breastfeeding since it is known to cross the placenta and enter the breast milk. Finally, just to go over the forms of fluoxetine that are available, 
There are capsules, tablets, oral suspensions, and oral solutions. Fluoxetine was cleverly discovered, carefully analyzed, and is a revolutionary pharmaceutical used to treat, among other things, major depression. While we enjoyed discussing the history and the use of this antidepressant, we hope our discussion has given the appropriate credit due to this medicinal masterpiece.